for geography, D for history, D for maths, D for walking, D for thinking, D for speaking, D for breathing. I got a D. I got a D. I grew up in a village called Marsden in, in West Yorkshire. I was always aware that there was another Marsden in this world uh, up on the northeast coast. You, you know, I'd look in an atlas and I'd see that there were two Marsdens. And I suppose at some point I thought, well, I'd like to go and have a poke around and see what this other place is like. Because when I got there, it doesn't exist. It had been bulldozed. Category D was a, a, a planning concept dreamt up by Durham Council after the Second World War. And what they had realised is the coal field, which was the biggest coal field the world will ever see, was in decline. And the villages that were there, and there were about 360 of them at that time, would not survive. So what they decided to do was put a planning blight on these villages, which meant there would be no further council investment. And the objective was to drive the people out of the villages and then bulldoze them. The community were up in arms about this because what they were having taken away from them was their own sense of being, place and community. I didn't know that these villages had been given this classification. I'm a villager myself, I think it's the, the sort of optimum form of living. So to be told that your village uh, is no good, to have the heart ripped out of it, uh, or in the cases of three or four villages, just to be obliterated from the face of the earth, uh, I felt an enormous sympathy for those places and uh, you know, wanted to, wanted to harmonise with them a little bit. In a foresight gale, the lighthouse twizzles like a barber's pole. On the upper deck, the jewelled lantern floats and meditates in a quicksilver bed. Its insect eye looks sideways at the field in the field. There was the lighthouse here at the time, oh, with the yeah. foghorn. Yes. Yeah, the foghorn. What about the light? Did the, did the I light used love to... the light going round on the night time because it used to go around the light in the bedroom, didn't yeah. it? You could see it going round when you're lying and looking through the fan light. It used to make you go to sleep, actually. I think at the height there was about 900 people lived here. Uh, I think there's about 119 houses, so you can imagine how many people lived in one house. Big families, no TV, nothing else to do, was there? <laughs> Some people were um, annoyed that they had to move, um, the older people especially. I know loads that said they didn't want to move. Um, they said they should have been able to put bathrooms and toilets on the houses, and you know, so they could stay here. Where was your house? Here, just here. On room. that side? Yeah, yeah. Where was yours, Brian? Just over Just the other there. side of the rise there, going down to the Near coast. The yeah. So you knew each other when you were when you well, were. Well, I knew Brian when he was smaller just... because I knew his mum and dad. Mm. Because Brian's a little bit younger than me. So um, what, what does it feel like to come back to a place where you grew up I that doesn't could... that doesn't exist anymore? It's sad, really, because I often wish I could still be here. You know, I wish those houses were still here. Because um, I think it would have been still a lovely place to live. I said when we die, we want our ashes to be scattered oh, here. Really? Where we used to yeah. live, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Quite yeah. a few already uh -huh. had them yeah. scattered yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. How old were you when the, the village was was flattened then? Oh, was I 11. was six when we left. Uh, I was about but the likes of Anne and that had already we left. left beforehand. Our yeah. house was still stunned, was one of the last yeah. to go. Yeah. These two streets had gone completely yeah. gone. I watched them yeah. being demolished as a yeah, six year old. In the centre of the bay is Marsden Rock, a bulbous chunk of limestone penetrated by a natural arch. Marsden Rock is just along the road there, about a mile to walk. It's been a rock there for as long as people remember. It's just a symbol of uh, 
where we live, Marsen. On the banner, the front of all the banners, they've always had the same picture on the front, Mars and rock, and the adage, as firm as a rock we stand. didn't know anything about it, how these entire communities have been wiped from the face of the earth. You feel a bit of um, like astonishment and it's quite recent history, but also I think I felt a bit of anger on the part of those communities. It's been really fascinating and especially for us to see these places. I spent two or three days up in County Durham, you know, walking around the, the geography and I suppose collecting stories, collecting language, just making a list of, of, of terms and phrases, and then went away and, and, and started writing. Some say she left in the dark. We went to the studio uh, for three days and we sat down in a room. Uh, we talked about the project a lot and we just started writing music. Piano, guitar, synthesizer, drums, um, building up um, I suppose, musical narratives around the pieces that I'd written. When we were in the studio, Simon just read the pieces out and went for our immediate kind of uh, response musically to them. And yeah, it was just really moving. When we first started talking about the project, you wouldn't think there'd be so much emotional um, energy behind what he's saying, but it, it's got all those factors of community and nostalgia and memory, and it just builds up. In three days, we had fundamentally the best part of four tracks ready to go. I think it's incredible to be shining a light onto these, these places that, that don't exist. Of the original 121 villages that were on the list, only four of them disappeared forever. Some have not fared so well. Uh, places like Grange Villa, which had disconnected really from uh, the conurbation of Newcastle or Sunderland, literally sort of out in the middle of nowhere, uh, are now really struggling because they have no bus service, they have no GP, um, a lot of their own community buildings like the Miners' Welfare are struggling um, and they have problems with uh, absentee landlords who bought up these houses and bring in people who are not from the village uh, who can be quite troublesome neighbours. Hadn't been for the pits there would be no Grange Villa. In the years between the 1880s and just before the First World War, that was a time when the village was thriving. Lots of different clubs and um, the workmen's club, the, the mission church, and the, I think the, that came in the 1940s. But lots of organisations, the, uh, the local jazz band, um, the cinema, uh, snooker hall, it was a thriving village. Why were some villages, uh, you know, bulldozed, but somewhere like Grange Villa managed to hang on? That was because Grange Villa didn't allow itself to die. And a, a certain amount of just bloody-mindedness, people saying, oh, we're, not, we're not moving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the fact that uh, everybody didn't just up sticks and, and go, which would have made it easier for the, uh, the council to come in and uh, flatten the land. The intention was that the, uh, the village would die. The, the people in the village, over many years, fought against it, resisted it, uh, didn't move and that's how the village was able to exist. There were 1,500 people living, living here. Um, now it's about half that. Today, Grange Villa is not the thriving community that it was, although there are lots of people who have lived here for a long time that are not prepared to let it go. They've got to allow some building, because if you're building new properties, then you're giving hope for the future. I got a D. I got a D. The 
There must be something structurally wrong with me. Making the recordings with Marsden Brassband from the village where I grew up. We would have used Marsden Band on the northeast coast, but of course the village no longer exists. I suppose we're we're trying to give them back uh, their voice by virtue of the fact that you know I'm from a village of the same name. They think it's great once you get past that initial playing something different and then appreciating the music behind what you're actually doing there and then. Um, and now I think, you know, they're enjoying playing it and hearing the, the final results of it. It's about, I think, paying homage to the fact that even though uh, there are far less brass bands than there used to be, they, they, they still serve as a really integral um, social and kind of emotional part of the community. Um, and I think, yeah, alchemy is very much about that and, and that's why that's become the kind of the main emotional point of the record is, is that tune. The tune uh, Alchemy is about brass bands and is about the community and the friendships and the kind of focus for a village that a brass band would create. It's, I suppose, a litany of, of phrases about the nature of, of brass bands, about the nature of what goes into uh, making the instruments and then what comes out of the instruments in the end. And it's slightly magical and fantastical, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to finish with the idea of what comes out of these astonishing metal shapes is breath people speaking, people talking uh, for, for their communities, for their, for their neighbours. Uh, so I, I was trying to write something almost, almost biblical. The brass factor is amazing and again adds this whole other emotional element to it. It's, it's such a big part of these villages and their history. So it's, uh, it's really amazing to feel like we're we're able to bring people together in that respect, and especially where we're recording today, which is the village Simon grew up, to, to use the brass band from his, his childhood, basically, feels very powerful. I've never recorded a brass band, or should I say I'd never have the opportunity to record a brass band. I certainly don't think that you can be prepared for not just the sound that it makes, but the way that it makes you feel. It's very much trying to tap into the idea of, of mining and the connection between brass bands and mining communities and that, that sort of digging down into the earth uh, and the heat and the fire and then the making of the brass, the forging of the instruments and then out of these instruments comes air, music, um, you know, sort of angelic sound so it's it's a sort of bottom to top uh, take on, on on the alchemy of of music making by mining communities some say she left in winter Tiptoed through snow, trailing black splinters of coal. A name traced in frost. We're standing in Addison village, uh, near Bladen, which was bulldozed, still called that, but it's a woodland. It's, uh, it was planted with trees, so you don't really see the original settlement and that was a policy too, that once the villages were bulldozed and were planted with trees so nobody could tell that people once lived here. And would it have been you know, a proper community with all the facilities that you usually associate with a, 
a, a mining village. Yeah, very much so. There was a, a miners welfare here and above miners welfare they always had reading rooms because of a high value on education. They would have had um, their own bar uh, and a place where theatre could be performed, amateur dramatics, probably had their own brass band. Yeah. I mean, these were seriously culturally rich communities. What about this feature here? Because that's the only thing that looks to me is any evidence of a settlement at all. Yeah, I mean, that, that was built in 1912. And what it, what it is is a, uh, a wagonway and a, a, used to haul the, the spoil from the, the, the pit up the hill and away from the community. And uh, the pit was uh, probably about another quarter of a mile up the hill. We've personified Addison as a woman who had to up sticks one night and, and leave. But every now and again comes back, I suppose, in, in ghost form among, among the woods, among the, among the trees. Some say she left in winter, tiptoed through snow, trailing black splinters of coal, a name traced in frost on a brick wall with a gloved finger. Some say she left on her own, no goodbyes, set off with a stone in her shoe and an anthracite heart down the turnpike road alone. Houses, Bellasus, Quaking Houses, North Beach Burn, Haswell Plow, Addison, Whiteley Head, Allen Deer Cottages. I, I think we're trying to make a congregation here of ideas, attitudes, sounds, you know, that, that, that finally brings people together a lot of people who were, who were dispersed. Um, maybe it's a, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm trying to unionize them through, through our work, but congregation is this, uh, this, this sort of ideal that I, I've got in mind for the, for the conclusion of the project. I think the lesson is complex. Uh, how do you pull together a plan that rejuvenates a county that's built on one single thing, which in the case of County Durham is coal mining. I think in the 1960s they uh, were trying to do this, they were trying to diversify the economy. What the planners forgot though is that people were at the heart of this. So there's got to be some way that you can uh, make planning decisions and strategies which involve people as much as calculation. It's been an education for me, it's been an education for the band. In lots of ways, you know, it's been a lesson in part of British history that I didn't know about, and it's an opportunity to, yeah, I'm going to say this, put those places back on the map. Camden Gate, Meadowfield, Craghead, Highgrange, Winlayton Mill, Pretty Me, Old Clarence, Washington States, Dean.